Thanks for starting your week with us. Hello and welcome to Business Daily. I'm Ijeon in Seoul. Let's get started with a look at today's highlights. Global tech giant Amazon recently launched its Prime Now instant delivery service in Singapore, challenging its Chinese rival Alibaba. More IT companies are looking to invest heavily in the healthcare industry amid Korea's rapidly aging population. These stories are more coming right up. But first, after a trial lasting over five months, the Independent Council has recommended a 12-year prison sentence for Samsung Group's de facto leader, Lee Jae-yong. The probe team was created to investigate a massive corruption scandal that led to the impeachment of former President Park Geun-hye. The council's list of charges against E include bribery, perjury and embezzlement read out at E's final court hearing at the Seoul Central District Court on Monday. The Samsung Air is suspected of bribing the former president and her close confidant Choi soon shil in exchange for illicit favors from the government. The court has announced the date of the final verdict, set to be delivered on August 25th. It looks like a joint committee meeting between Seoul and Washington to discuss their free trade agreement will not be happening this week. Guidelines stipulated in the Korea-US FTA say both parties are to meet within 30 days after a review request is made. Now that would be this Friday, August 11th. But according to reports, the U.S. Trade Office has called on industry advisors to submit feedback on matters of fair trade with Korea by August 15th. Additionally, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer's schedule takes him to Togo in West Africa this week before he attends the first NAFTA review meeting in Washington on the 16th. Seoul and Washington are also still at odds on where the meeting should take place. And moving on to markets to tell us more about today's stock market action as well as upcoming market events this week, we have our markets contributor E.G. He joining us on the phone today. Hello, Ji He. Hello, Jian. All right, so stocks closed on a slightly higher note today. Can you tell us more? Sure. Well, the benchmark, the benchmark cost closed 0.14% today to close at 2,398.75, while the tech-heavy Kosdaq also gained 1.06% to finish at 648.39. The main bourse was underpinned by gains in the steel, bio, and pharmaceutical sectors, with Korea's largest steelmaker, POSCO, closing up 2.4%. Among other index heavyweights, Naver surged 2.58%, while KB Financial Group gained 2.25% to the top leaderboard on the Kospi. The Kospi was underpinned by strong foreign buying, with offshore investors purchasing a net 93.6 billion won worth of shares, while institutional buyers also added a net 93.5 billion worth. Now, can you give us a rundown of the key market events lined up for this week then? Sure, June. Starting off the week, St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank President James Bullard is expected to discuss the U.S. economy and monetary policy at the America's Cotton Marketing Cooperative 2017 Conference in Nashville. And Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari will also be expected to take part in a session at the Sioux Falls Rotary Club event in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On Tuesday, South Korea, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance will be releasing the data on recent economic trends for the previous month. Especially coming out of an increase in exports and an improvement in consumer sentiment, investors are looking to see if the government will continue its optimism from its green book a month before. Some analysts are saying that domestic economy recovery has quite a long way to go, hinting at potential instability at the service sectors. The Bank of Korea on Wednesday will also be releasing trends for the finance market market from July. Focus will be on whether the Moon Jae-in administration's approach to the real estate measures that it announced in June will have a lasting effect on domestic household debt. As of the last month, the BOK announced a slightly dropped margin of increase in household loans and an expansion in mortgage loans. Also on Friday, the U.S. Labor Department will release its consumer price index for July. It's a key data point for the Fed, whose decision on whether or not to raise interest rates within this year hinges on any signs of pickup in inflation. 
Price growth has remained subdued in recent months, despite a solid job market and broader signs of recovery in the U.S. economy. This has been EGH for Business Daily. Fresh data shows the government's job creation goal in the public sector has fallen short in the first half of the year. In response to high youth unemployment, the finance ministry had said it would achieve 56 percent of their full year jobs target of some 20,000 new public sector jobs in the first six months of the year. But data from a government portal showed it achieved only 49% of the annual target between January and June, which is about 1,360 jobs short. This represents a drop from the average of 50% in the first halves of the years between 2013 and 2015. Teo Engineering and Samsung Engineering have won contracts worth nearly 5 billion U.S. dollars combined for a refinery project in Oman. A consortium between Teo Engineering and a Spanish contractor won a package worth $2.75 billion that covers the engineering and construction of the main processing units. A separate $2 billion contract was awarded to a joint venture between Samsung Engineering and a UK-based oil and gas provider. Now, the deal will cover the construction of utilities, storage tanks, and other off-site facilities. The latest statistics are once again showing the number of tourists visiting Korea is on a sharp decline. According to a report released by the Korea Immigration Service, the number of inbound travelers to Korea plunged 35.5 percent on year in June. The figure represents a drop of over 550,000 people compared to the same period last year, although edging up 1.4 percent from May. On the other hand, outbound passengers saw a 4.5 percent increase from May, while jumping 17.7 percent on year. The drop in inbound travelers has been blamed on China's retaliatory measures in response to Korea's THAAD deployment. In June, the country saw just over 270,000 arrivals from China, only around one-third of the number seen in June 2016. Singapore's Chang'e International Airport is set to open its newest terminal later this year. Passengers traveling through one of the busiest transportation hubs in the world will not only see a new building, but new technology as well. Our Elliot Kim tells us more. Terminal 4 of Singapore's Changi International Airport is set to launch later this year with construction costing 723.6 million U.S. dollars. While currently the world's sixth busiest airport for international travel, its last expansion came more than a decade ago. The new terminal will increase the airport's annual capacity by nearly 25 percent, from 66 to 82 million passengers. When Terminal 4 opens, we are able to serve 16 million passengers per annum. Now, that is actually quite significant in terms of the overall addition to the Changi Airport's uh, terminal capacity. The terminal will make full use of technologies that have been under trials and testing for many months. It will offer a range of self-service options to allow a traveler to go through the entire flight process without ever interacting with a human. From facial recognition for check-ins and bag drops to automated immigration and boarding processes, the airport expects the automated departure process will save 20 percent in manpower. Well, I'll say Terminal 4 is really a flagship terminal for innovation. Uh, in many different ways, we are leveraging the latest technology and innovative ideas to uh, improve the whole operations efficiency as well as manpower productivity in a terminal. Increased automation addresses one of the major issues facing the country, a lack of manpower. Like the other terminals, Terminal 4 showcases the art and history of the country that travelers have come to expect there. Preparation is already underway for the construction of a fifth terminal expected to arrive within the next decade. The building will add capacity for another 50 million passengers in its initial phase and would push the airport past Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport for the busiest in the world. Elliot Kim. Business Daily. The U.
U.S. e-commerce giant Amazon has launched its two-hour Prime Now services in Singapore. But Amazon has its eyes not only on the city-state, but the greater region of Southeast Asia as well. Here's our Yunus Kim with more. The e-commerce giant Amazon that continues to make its mark as a disruptor in its home market of the United States now has its eyes on Southeast Asia. Its gateway to the sprawling region? Singapore, where residents can now enjoy two-hour delivery on its roster of goods via its Amazon Prime Now application. Leveraging Amazon's 20 years of operational technology excellence, this is the first time in any country or any city that we're launching Prime Now without an existing retail presence or a fulfillment network. This is truly a first for Amazon. It's an arrival that's been the talk of the town for months. Many view Amazon's pivot to the city-state as its first head-to-head -head confrontation with China's Alibaba Group, already a presence not only in the Lion City, but in the region at large. Ahead of Amazon's announcement, Alibaba invested another $1 billion into its Southeast Asia-focused e-tailer Lazada. Our services will drive Singapore's urban logistics, e-commerce, and retail industries. It will also help small and medium-sized enterprises participating in the growing digital economy. Indeed, Amazon says its urban fulfillment center of about 100,000 square feet is its largest Prime Now exclusive fulfillment center in the world. But the company's ambitions lie beyond the English-speaking state of about 5 million people. The region of Southeast Asia is home to more than 600 million people and virgin territory for e-commerce, as only a fraction of total sales are conducted online. But it's not without its slew of challenges, given its various languages, regulatory environment and sprawling islands, to name a few. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. The fast-growing augmented reality market is expected to double annually for the next four years. According to International Data Corporation, spending on augmented and virtual reality products and services is expected to rise from $11.4 billion in 2017 to nearly $215 billion U.S. dollars in 2021. Experts see consumer retail and manufacturing sectors to lead the investment and adoption of AR technology in the early stages. Usage by government services, transportation and education are also gaining ground as the transformative capabilities of these technologies continue to receive more spotlight. Big IT companies are starting to see more ways of applying technology in the field of healthcare. So, what's driving such big tech firms to invest more in healthcare and diseases? Our Yi Jiang has more. In recent years, the healthcare industry has seen a massive influx of technological innovations allowing health providers to take different approaches to diagnosis, treatment and care. IBM's AI technology named Watson, known as the world's smartest supercomputer, has correctly diagnosed illnesses that have stumped human doctors. Apple launched its healthcare app HealthKit in 2014, collecting and delivering medical data, while Google had also launched Google Genomics for researchers to analyze genomes like never before. One of the biggest driving forces behind global IT companies' entry into the healthcare market is a rapidly aging population. With the elderly population around the world projected to increase further, IT companies are encouraging healthcare innovations and providing new products like advanced data analysis tools that are tailored to the industry. When you think about bio or health, it used to be about lab experiments. Nowadays, it's about analysis. For example, machines do the analysis for us, allowing us to look at the results and check for issues within a gene. That's the power of IT technology. Experts believe that future technological innovations like genetic information analysis will allow healthcare providers to provide personalized treatment services like never before. Yi Juyong, Business Daily. Now, as it's the case for many other fruits, the core of the Korean pear is usually thrown out because of its hard and rough texture, which makes it hard to eat. However, recently, Korean researchers have found a use for them in making natural exfoliators and toothpaste. Our Park Se-young has the story. 
When a pear is dipped into dye, the middle turns red. The cells that turn red are stone cells which surround the fruit's seeds. Their gritty texture means they're usually thrown out, but scientists have found a use for them in beauty products. A facial exfoliator made with powdered stone cells is four times more effective than ordinary cleansing creams. I've used many different products but felt like they didn't remove all the impurities from my skin. The one made using pears has coarse particles and made my skin less greasy. Toothpaste made using pears was also found to be more effective at polishing, even when compared with plaque-removing toothpaste and walnut shell toothpaste. Toothpaste and cosmetics often use plastic microbeads, which will be banned from the market from August due to their impact on the environment, and stone cells in pears are seen as a potential replacement. Farmers can also harvest the stone cells from fallen or insect-damaged fruits, meaning less of their crop goes to waste. The Rural Development Administration plans to quickly transfer this technology so that pear cosmetics can be commercialized by later this year and pear toothpaste as early as next year. Park se Business Daily. Dessert is something that many people can't live without nowadays, and the good news is that traditional Korean desserts are becoming more popular not only among Koreans but among foreigners as well. So today we take a look at the market for Korean desserts and how they have been transformed with a modern twist. Even amid economic sluggishness, the dessert market has grown each year. The westernization of Korean food culture has increased interest not only in various foods but also in desserts. Consumers' desire to enjoy small luxuries, even amid the recession, has had a major impact on the dessert industry. Befitting this trend, various attempts are being made at the Korea Traditional Food Culture Center, opened in 2016. The Korea Traditional Food Culture Center, EAM, is a comprehensive cultural space where Korean drinks and food can be tasted, experienced and purchased. The second floor of the Korea Traditional Food Culture Center is a cafe serving Korean desserts and teas. Only products from six government-approved tea masters are sold. Very good. I think uh, maybe next time I'll try uh, some hot tea. Uh, and for the more full experience. What's the most popular item on the menu at the center where 20% of visitors are foreigners? It's fusion traditional tea, which helps beat the heat. Fermented green tea is turned into sweet milk tea, and milcha, or tea grown in the shade, is reinvented as a refreshing latte. Persimmon vinegar made by aging sweet persimmons for over three years becomes a popular persimmon aid. How do such fusion traditional drinks appeal to those more accustomed to coffee after meals? Korean people drink too much coffee. This sweet and sour drink is made from omija berries. It's quite good. A hands-on traditional food program, which anyone can attend with a reservation, has also become a popular course. The aim is to promote a better understanding of traditional Korean teas and offer fine memories of their flavors. It's very tasty, and the in-depth explanation piqued my interest. Experts advise that a flexible attitude is needed to globalize Korean desserts rather than an insistence on tradition. If both past and currently popular Korean flavors and desserts embody our senses, then there's no need to insist on traditional desserts for globalization. Global desserts popular in Korea now can become Korean desserts if they're made in our style. As the summer weather heats up, Demand rises for papingsu, a shaved ice dish and Korean dessert favorite. With the popularity of so-called healthy pleasures, diverse pingsu variations are using ingredients like organic rice, honeycomb, and red ginseng. Most popular of all is purple bingsu. Last year, the global interest was explosive, with 5 million views recorded on Facebook in just three days. This pingsu, 
made with a purple puree on ice instead of red beans, uses purple yams grown in Korea as the key ingredient. The purple image of purple yams best fits the Korean and modern image we aspire to, which is why we use the ingredient. The yam chips and walnuts which decorate the dish resembles flowers. Even the minute details are attended to. Purple, a highly regarded color both in the East and the West, is also appealing to foreign diners. I think this place is pretty representative of desserts in Korea, and I like it a lot because it's not too sweet, but it's really, it's different, and um, it, was, it was really smooth, and um, it, was, it was really pretty, it's the most important one. Thanks to the Pingsu using purple yams, which are rich in dietary fiber, the company's sales increased roughly threefold in three years. The delicious flavor matches how pretty it is visually. Sweet potatoes are popular these days. We really like it. That's why I came to try it. About 50% of this company's clients are foreigners. In June of this year, the company began a global expansion, starting with Thailand and the U.S. Korean desserts, like those of other countries, combine flavor and style. Efforts are being made to publicize this aspect. Amid the dominance of Western desserts, Korean-style desserts are devising new strategies. It remains to be seen whether global tastes can be captivated with the development of original new dishes based on traditional flavors. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.